good morning. Welcome in Jesus' name. In this morning's bulletin, you will find an extra um, insert uh, from our CLC ministry by mail um, ministry, and it um, centering on Christian education. Please uh, take that home with you and, and, and give that your consideration, your review for what it's worth in our situation. Um, but that's not our theme for the day. Our theme for the day really focuses on, on the Lord's grace and mercy towards undeserving sinners and how he has drawn us into the family of God. Let us pray. O Lord, our maker, redeemer, and comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. Open our hearts by your Holy Spirit that through the preaching of your word we may be brought to repent of our sins, believe on Jesus in life and in death, and grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our opening hymn is hymn 281, The Savior Calls, Let Every Ear. Please follow the order of service as it is printed in our service bulletin. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, we are sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions. 
but we are sorry for our transgressions and pray you of your bountiful mercy to be gracious and merciful unto us. Forgive us for Jesus' sake, renew us by your Spirit, and lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We are forgiven. With boldness and confidence, we may approach the throne to find grace to help in time of need. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom to know is everlasting life, grant us to know your Son, Jesus, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may boldly confess him to be the Christ and steadfastly walk in the way that leads to life eternal. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. In our epistle lesson, Paul expresses his, his heartfelt, deep heartfelt concern for the spiritual welfare of his fellow countrymen and expresses how it is that that. God will use the opportunities, the circumstances that arise in life to his advantage, to call sinners to repentance, to call Gentiles to repentance, and then also the people of the Jewish nation. All are under God's mercy. We read from Paul's epistle to the Romans in the 11th chapter beginning with the 13th verse. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown to you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. In our gospel lesson this morning, we read of a familiar account where a woman comes to the Lord with with her urgent need for deliverance. What's important, the feature that we want to to grasp is that she was of a different people, not the Jews, a Canaanite, one that would be shunned by the Jews, and yet Jesus first tests and then strengthens and then praises her faith. We read from Matthew's Gospel, the 15th chapter, beginning with the 21st verse. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. 
My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Here ends our gospel. We profess our Christian faith with the whole Christian church on earth. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with hymn number 375, If Thy Beloved Son, O God. Yeah. 
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our sermon meditation this morning is found recorded in the book of the prophet Isaiah in his 56th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, says, Yet I will gather to him others, besides those who are gathered to him. This is the word of God. Sanctify us, O Lord, through your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. In Christ Jesus, dear fellow redeemed, we often equate the beginning of what we call the New Testament church with the beginning of the Christian faith. For sure, the world does. If you go into history books and you're looking up when did different religions, world religions begin, you will find that just as Mohammed started the Muslim faith and Joseph Smith started the Mormon faith, they will report that the Christian faith began with a teacher from Galilee named Jesus and that his disciples spread this faith throughout the world. That would be the world's explanation of how it is that you, became a Christian. They would add that it was certainly by an accident of birth, just like it is that so many millions of people from India are Hindu. So it was just an accident of birth that you were born into a Christian family, and so you are a Christian of some sort or another. We know better than that. At least I hope we know better than that. But I have encountered this line of thinking regularly, sometimes even in the church. The world's ideas permeate our thinking so much more than we realize. Even among those of us who attend church, regularly and it is not just in the areas of of sexual morality and gender dysphoria or with science and evolution and and those things it invades the basic truth of our salvation many christians are influenced in their thinking about the role and place of of good works in our salvation and in our christian life Many Christians are influenced wrongly 
concerning the need to repent for one's sins. And many Christians are swayed in their thinking concerning the fact, the basic truth, that there is salvation in no one else other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. One of the ways that this happens is mistaken ideas about the beginnings of our Christian faith and how and why it is that you believe in Jesus Christ. This is the central thought to our worship service this morning. We look at our gospel lesson and we learn how, how Jesus interacted with that Canaanite woman, testing and strengthening her faith when, when the disciples just wanted her to be dismissed. After all, she was just one of those people. And they shouldn't associate with her. But Jesus did. Just like Jesus associated with that Samaritan woman of all sorts, a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, and then he stayed there for days teaching Samaritans the truth of salvation. Paul also addressed this gracious truth in our epistle lesson this morning, pointing out how God used the Jews' rejection of Jesus as an opportunity to reach out to the Gentile world, to Gentiles. And how the Lord would look for opportunities to reach out again to the people of the Jews to call his elect to faith and salvation. Our text was written by inspiration six centuries before Jesus was born. And yet it reveals to us the will of God for the salvation of his people. Yes, our Christian faith goes back into Old Testament times, as you well know. When we stop and think about the beginning of the Christian faith, we know it goes way back to the Garden of Eden to when God presented that first gospel promise to those two sinners lost before him, Adam and Eve. And they were called to faith through that gospel message. What Isaiah points out so beautifully for us in our text is how the Lord graciously gathers his chosen people. In the opening verse of our text, we see that the Lord does this by revealing his salvation. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Without doubt, this is a call to repentance, but a call to repentance that is quite different from from the calls to repentance in the first 39 chapters, the early section of Isaiah's prophecy, most of those calls to repentance were tied very hard to promises of coming judgment. This one is tied to promise of coming salvation. How different is that? You might ask, how different is that? Well, it comes from the Lord. And that is clear throughout Isaiah's writings. But here we do well to remember what we mean when we say the Lord, and it's all in caps. Jehovah, Yahweh. The God who revealed himself to Moses as, as the God of deliverance. The God of promise. The covenant God. His name his name alone brings to us that awareness that, that God is looking to save us from our sin. It is important to look for the gospel when the Lord speaks to us in his word. And there it is in the opening verse of our text. While the Lord calls for the people to repent and keep justice and righteousness in their lives, he then speaks of his salvation coming. Yes, salvation came to us in Jesus. 
And we know how Isaiah very graphically reveals the sufferings of our Lord that he endured as, as our Redeemer, as he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, as the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, the Lord says in our text, this salvation is about to appear, but it's another 600 years before Jesus is born. 600 years doesn't seem like about to appear to us, but 600 years to the eternal God? What is that? He would send his only begotten son into this world to bear our sins to the cross. And in Jesus' death, the salvation of our Lord God has come. With the coming of this salvation in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God was revealed. You remember the theme passage to the epistle to the Romans? We've all memorized it, I think. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's what we're reading about in this verse in Isaiah. That righteousness of God, that salvation that has come to us, that, that gospel that is a power of God to salvation. And that was as true in the days of Isaiah as it was in the days of the Apostle Paul when he wrote those words by inspiration. As it is yet today, the Lord gathers his chosen people through the power of the gospel. He calls them to repentance, that is to trust in the Lord for forgiveness and life, turning away from their sin, turning to righteousness and justice so that their lives are filled with the love of God, filled with those kinds of works that are a demonstration of God's mercy and grace and love to to the people of this world who are oppressed, oppressed by the devil or oppressed by other circumstances of life. What is even more fascinating and marvelous for us is learning how God gathers his people to himself by qualifying the disqualified. You know, any one of us to be pointed to and say, well, you're disqualified. You're disqualified. Every day we sin. And any one sin is enough to be told, I'm sorry, but you're disqualified. Now, the Old Testament law, the ceremonial law laid out very stringent rules and regulations about who was qualified to come into the temple to worship the Lord, to, to participate in singing hymns of praise, to participate in presenting offerings to the Lord, to participate in those sacrifices where the one bringing the offering actually ate part of the sacrifice as, as a symbol of what it meant to have fellowship with God. original audience of Isaiah's words here, this was just automatically instilled in their heart. So when we read these verses again, I want you to try and not read them and hear them like a 21st century Gentile, but a Jew, a citizen of Jerusalem, before the fall into to, before the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon, the Babylonian captivity. Also the sons of the foreigner who joined themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast 
my covenant. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel says, Yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. Those words had to be almost shocking to the ears of Isaiah's first audience. Foreigners on the mountain of God inside the temple courts participating in the sacrifices and the offerings of the Lord. Foreigners. The Lord says in the future he is going to bring people into the house of the Lord who weren't qualified to be there. Foreigners who love the Lord and desire to serve him. In the fulfillment of these words of prophecy, this, this wasn't about a stone structure as glorious as it might have been. This was about something that was far grander and more glorious. It was about that spiritual temple which is made up of people. The Lord was bringing in these people, these foreigners and sons of foreigners and, and all sorts of, of crippled and maimed and disfigured people that weren't qualified according to the law of Moses to be in the mix of the people of God and who should never be considered for participating in the singing of psalms and hymns and sharing in that sacrificial meal. Only the Lord can make the disqualified qualified to be among his people. Only the Lord can make anyone qualified to come into his presence, to lay petitions before him, to worship him, to sing his praises. Only the Lord can do this by the blood of the Lamb of God. For it is the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, that cleanses us from all sin. We are adorned by Christ's robes of righteousness. And so the Lord has chosen us by his grace and called us out of the world to be his own special people. Yes, we are those foreigners and sons of foreigners. But then Paul wrote to the Ephesians, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. I hope you understand who we're talking about. I think you do. You weren't qualified to address God in prayer. You weren't qualified even to say his name. Worship him in any way. You were disqualified from birth because you and I, well, we were born utterly sinful. And yet God in his grace has cleansed us and and made us his own and declared us to be perfectly qualified to be among the people of God and to serve the Lord with gladness, with joy in our hearts to the Lord. When you think about that, what kind of response do you think that should evoke for, from us? Isn't that it exactly, that we should serve the Lord with gladness? Remember the words of King David in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You can feel the joy, the, the excitement at the prospect of going to hear the word of the Lord and to sing his praise. Isn't that what the Lord should see in all of us? An eagerness, a joy to come before his presence with singing, to worship the Lord, to serve him with gladness all our days? That is the kind of 
the keeping of the Sabbath that still pertains to our lives today that was mentioned in our text. We should gladly offer the Lord the sacrifices of our offerings and more than that. Paul wrote again to the Romans, in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Offering our lives and our very being to the Lord in this sense, that, that we dedicate ourselves to him, that we serve him and, and submit our, our wills, our thoughts, our desires to his will. Considering the wonder of the grace that has come to us, that, that we have been qualified to be among the Lord's people only by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, yes, a total submission to the word and will of God. That's reasonable. That is our reasonable service something that we should do with joy in our hearts to the Lord. People in this world would encourage us to be true to ourselves, fulfill our desires, go for the gusto. And they might think you're a little bit of a nutcase if you tell them you're excited about going to church. That's okay, let them think what they want. Let's serve the Lord and praise him who has qualified us for salvation. And we, we can flip that. Not feeling a joy at the prospect of hearing the word or praising the Lord or feeling a need to serve the Lord or worship him who saved us from hell. That's symptomatic of a of a spiritual malady. One that could get serious and if allowed to go on without being addressed could lead to spiritual death. Back to where we began. What was that? Oh yeah, that question. How is it that you happen to be a Christian. You should never again think that it was an accident of birth or an act of your own will. The Lord graciously gathers his people and he does this by revealing his salvation and bringing upon us his righteousness purchased for us by Christ Jesus perfectly fulfilling the law for us and offering his self, himself for us on the cross. God gathered us to be among his people by making us who were disqualified by our own sin, qualified through the righteousness of Christ Jesus. You are a Christian a member of the household of God by the grace and power of God alone. Praise his name with joy now and forever. Amen. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our God in heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the precious Christian fellowship which we are now enjoying in your name. We thank you for the privilege of worshiping you, the true and only God, and for the privilege of hearing your word by which we grow in faith towards a better understanding of your love. Give us all a sincere longing to assemble here in your name to worship you and to be edified by the preaching and teaching of your word. Heavenly Father, as we look upon the week just ended, we must confess that we have not always obeyed your word and commandments nor sought to follow the perfect example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our days have been all too often marked by failure to do all the good things which you delight to see in your adopted children. How often we have sinned and deserved only your wrath. But we ask you to forgive our sins for the sake of your Son, whom you sent to die on the cross for us. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, help us cling to you forever in true faith as our Savior and Lord, who loved us and redeemed us from our sins with your own precious blood. Through the word of salvation which we have heard here today, increase our faith and deepen our appreciation of your sacrifice on Calvary. May our lives more and more reflect your love which is taken over in our hearts. Guide us and our loved ones on our way through life and guard and defend us from every evil. O Holy Spirit, open our hearts to the word of truth spoken here today. Cause us to mature in the faith and to have a deeper love for our God and for one another. Give to all of us who worship here the grace to praise our God continually with our whole lives by pursuing only those matters and desiring only those things which are righteous and good. Grant us the gifts of patience, kindness, and gentleness that we may help family and neighbor that we may be forgiving, that we may live honestly with all people. May our voices lifted together this hour serve not only to glorify you, our God, but also mutually to comfort and strengthen one another. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And we join in praying in Jesus' name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone. A trust, O Lord, from thee. May we thy bounties thus as stewards true receive, and gladly, as thou blessest us, to thee our first fruits give. Amen. We continue with hymn 37. Lord, tis not that I did choose thee.
are thy grace not chosen me. Thou hast from the sin that stained me, washed and cleansed and set me free, and unto this end or change me that I ever live to thee. Twas thy grace in Christ that called me, taught my darkened heart and mind, else the world had yet enthralled me to thy heavenly glories blind. Now my heart owns none above thee, for thy grace alone I thirst, knowing well that if I love thee, thou, O Lord, didst love me first. Praise the God of all creation, praise the Father's boundless love. Praise the Lamb, our expiation, priest and King enthroned above. Praise the Spirit of salvation, him whom our spirits live, undivided adoration to the great Jehovah Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We close with the first verse of hymn 45. <laughs> Please note that a church council meeting, the August church council meeting, which um, was moved from last Sunday, we have the church picnic. So we're, that's going to follow the service today. Um, that will be in the church office immediately after the service. Uh, please note also that on September 10th, our fall schedule resumes. Basically, that means that um, Bible class will begin again, and we will encourage the children that aren't present here today to start coming so we can have Sunday school. That would be a real blessing to see that again. Um, speaking of blessings, it was a blessing for I own Nats. Last Sunday, late afternoon, she was called to be with the Lord. Um, her funeral service by uh, her own arrangement and the desire of her family was a private graveside service um, out at Grandview Cemetery just south of town here that was held um, that was conducted on Friday afternoon. Um, I uh, have a few copies, and I can make more of them, of, of, that, of the bulletin for that service out in, in, um, in the narthex, right around the corner as you go out, for those that are interested. And her obituary is printed on the back page of, of that uh, bulletin. Um, so is there any other announcement? Oh, yeah. We really need your help today. I got way more of these beautiful little orange tomatoes than I can eat. So all of them that are in there need to disappear. Uh, they're really sweet. If you have trouble with acid with tomatoes, these aren't a problem. I mean, th this is your answer right here. Um, so take a, a little baggie or whatever of, of tomatoes home with you. Eat them in the car on your way home. They're that good. You know, I just 
Every time I go past the plant, I pop a couple in my mouth, you know. So, so if you'd help me out with that problem, I would appreciate it. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Thank you.